like to uh, conclude today a message series from one of the best-known sections of Scripture, probably the best-known chapter in the Bible, Psalm 23, and I encourage you to view this great section of Scripture not just as beautiful poetry, but as it is the living and abiding Word of God, rock-solid truth for you. In fact, you really uh, want to make Psalm 23 part of your 2023. And let, let 2023 be rooted and uh, shaped by Psalm 23. Uh, I do have a little concoction here with me again, and uh, hopefully make it through without uh, too many coughs this morning. And if I do, let me just apologize to you in advance. I am so sorry. Uh, you, you deserve better than to have uh, uh, coughing episodes inflicted upon you, and I apologize. I'll do my do my best, okay? Uh, I've got a couple of aims in this series we've done over the last two or three weeks. One is to encourage you, all of you as uh, followers uh, of of the Good Shepherd, uh, Jesus Christ, and in those times where you feel uh, jaded, tired, flat, a little discouraged, hey, it happens. It happens. And for 3,000 years, this section of Scripture has been used as a boost to God's, God's people, helping you and me find peace and strength and joy. But I have a second aim, not just to encourage, but to entice. For those of you and for those of you watching, you're not yet followers of the Good Shepherd. Or you've, uh, you're going through a, a real season where you've been stiff-arming him. These promises can be for you too. So take a step in his direction. These blessings are yours when the Lord is your shepherd. Okay, Psalm 23, I'm going to have it here on the screen from the New King James Version. Why don't, I'll, I'll read it. Why don't you read it with me? Let's read it aloud and loudly. Here we go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever." You know, I told you over the last couple of weeks, reminded you that being called a sheep is not necessarily a a compliment because sheep are pretty dumb animals. They are defenseless. They desperately need a shepherd. They are prone to wander. About the best a sheep can do is go ba. That's not very intimidating, is it? And just to remind you how gullible and foolish and desperately in need of a shepherd sheep are, watch this video. Oh, there you go. Slow motion, there you go. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's you, my friends, and that is me. All all of us like sheep are gone astray, prone to wander. That's why we need the grace of our good shepherd, and we need the truth of our good shepherd keeping us between the ditches. All right, I have two simple points this morning. Here's the first one. The Lord protects me against evil. The Lord protects me against evil. Verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Notice now in the, in the 23rd Psalm, the change in pronouns. Earlier, it's been third person, You're talking about the shepherd, but now he's speaking to the shepherd. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
I mentioned that Psalm 23 is the best known chapter in the Bible. And out of that chapter, probably verse 4 is the best known statement from Psalm 23. You've heard it often. Do you remember what you were doing on September 11, 2001? I remember exactly what I was doing that day. The deadliest terrorist attack in human history. Four coordinated attacks on our nation, resulting in 2,977 deaths and over 25,000 injuries. That night, President George Bush delivered a brief message from the White House to comfort and reassure the nation. Perhaps you remember watching that. He quoted Psalm 23, 4. He said this, Tonight I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve, for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Let me put a few statements up here on the screen. First of all, your valleys are not destinations. They're not destinations. They are mile markers along your journey, but the words of Psalm 23 are carefully chosen. You walk through the valley, through it, not to it. In other words, there is high ground on the other side, and that's the ultimate destination. And many of you here today, you know, there's more than one dark valley. And many of you here today could say, you know, that's right. I've been through that valley of disappointment or divorce or a, or a, a, a sudden illness or a world-breaking experience. And, and yes, I've come through on the other side. And the Lord walked with me. And I learned some lessons. And actually, that valley that I walked through, it's now part of my testimony. It's part of my story. Actually, even made part of my ministry in serving the Lord. Christian singer and comedian Mark Lowry once, was once asked if he had a uh, life verse. He said, oh yeah, it's found several times in the Bible. It goes like this, and it came to pass, and it came to pass. The Bible doesn't say, and it came to stay. It came to pass, and what you're going through will pass. You'll pass through it. The Lord will be with you. There will come a day you will pass, and the Lord will be with you. Your valleys are not destinations. You go through it, not to it. Secondly, you're never alone in a valley. I will fear no evil. Why? Because I fully understand what's going to happen? No. Because I can write the script myself? No. Because I understand all the mysteries? No. I fear no evil because you are with me. And listen, my friends, the Lord is not cheering you on from the cheap seats. He's given you his Holy Spirit, which is the real invisible presence of God within you and among you. John 14, Jesus says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate, uh, an advocate, somebody defending you, somebody interceding for you, somebody fighting for you to help you and to be with you forever. You know, sometimes we say to ourselves, how in the world can I trust a God that I cannot see? I can see the problems. I can see the threats. I can see the valley. I can't see God. Harry Emerson Fosdick once preached a message entitled, "Why Why I Am a Theist. He said when he was a boy, he'd look outside And he would see the branches and the leaves on a tree move. And he just assumed as a boy that it was the moving of the leaves and the branches that caused the the wind to blow. In other words, it was the branches that he could see that was causing the movement of the wind he could not see. But as he grew older and became an adult, he realized it was the very opposite. He He discovered it was the wind he could not see that moved the branches that he could. And our great invisible God, who is as real as anything you count as reality, invisibility makes him no less real, no less powerful, no less present. 
And when you lay your head on your pillow tonight, you can know that the living God is with you and for you. I say this and I mean well. Some of you think you should be able to decipher and understand everything that goes on in life. And you assume that if your connection with God were just stronger, you'd be able to figure it all out. You do not have all the answers. Life's not a riddle to be mastered. It's a journey to be walked in faith. And our security, my friends, is not in what we know in terms of beyond what's been revealed in Scripture. Our security is not what we can discern and fathom in the mysteries of our life. Our security is in the one in whom we know. Our security is in who we know. And we know the good shepherd. Psalm 23, the messianic psalm, pointing us to the good shepherd, Jesus. And here's another statement. Jesus sees you through the darkest valley of all, which is the valley of the shadow of death. But again, those words are chosen deliberately. You'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But the reality of the second death, the reality of spiritual death, Jesus took the reality of that for you and for me. Separated from God for us, died as a sacrifice for our sins. And you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Shadow can't hurt you. Matthew Henry said, the shadow of a snake cannot bite you. The shadow of a sword cannot kill you. And the shadow of death cannot destroy you. And as a believer in Christ, you have this assurance. Beyond the shadow of death, there is the sunlight of eternal day. Death is a stubborn fact, and it is still our greatest fear. Somebody says, oh, no, no, it's not. My greatest fear is a fear of falling. Yeah, falling and dying. Mm -hmm. But if you belong to the flock of God, the moment of your death will be the most glorious experience you've ever enjoyed in a moment and the twinkling of an eye. To be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Whoa, what? Your rod, that's a weapon. You've heard of, you know, walk softly but carrying a big stick. The good shepherd walks softly but he carries a big stick. How can the world can a paddle, a rod, a weapon comfort me? Because it's not used on sheep. It's used on the enemies. Used on the predators. There is no enemy that intimidates the good shepherd. I'm not saying you'll always be cushioned and kept from disappointment and pain, but the good shepherd will protect you from evil. <laughs> I've told you, uh, some of you before, when I was in college, one of my summer jobs when, uh, uh, one year, I, I built mobile homes. I worked for Challenger Mobile Homes. Um, and There were six stations in constructing a mobile home. I, I worked on the floor station. One of my college buddies, Steve Kennard, worked with me. He's now Dr. G. Stephen Kennard. But we worked that summer um, assembling the floors on on mobile homes. And most of us were college kids at that particular station. Now our foreman was not. But the next station up was the wall station. And the wall wall station, they were all year-round employees. And they did not take kindly to, to the summer help. And they loved to talk trash and smack to us, which wasn't really a problem except the wall station was located right by the soft drink machines. And so every day during break, during lunch, you had to walk by the wall station guys and listen, you know, to their trash talk. But thankfully, a couple of weeks into that summer job, we got a new foreman on the floor station. His name was Buster. And Buster was a big, brawny, X con. 
Buster really liked me for some reason. I don't know. I think he was fascinated. And uh, I was fascinated by him. We'd have lunch together regularly. But Buster heard the wall guys talking smack to me and some of my buddies. And Buster had a few words with them. He said, you hassle my guys again, you're going to have to deal with me. And my friends, it was a new day from there on. <laughs> and whenever I'd walk down to the soft drink machines right there by the wall, guys, they didn't say a word. And I didn't just sort of walk down there. I strutted down there every day. You know why? Because Buster's rod and staff, they comforted me. <laughs> That's exactly it. Your good shepherd will see you through. And secondly, the Lord is our mighty forever host. Our mighty forever host. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. <laughs> How can he do that? Because no enemy intimidates the good shepherd. That's why. And in David's world, there was hardly a day he didn't have an enemy. And so if he was going to have a good meal, it was going to be on a day when he had an enemy. Did you know that in this world, until you get to heaven, you're not going to have a day without trouble? There's going to be some point of conflict or difficulty or a burden. But in the midst of it all, our God, just like you need meals to sustain you physically, he will give you strength moment by moment. Give me this day my daily bread. Give me this day my daily strength. And he, even in the midst of enemies and trouble and adversaries, will be your strength. And he anoints my head with oil. David knew all about that. Three times in his lifetime, his head was anointed with oil, which is a signature moment saying, you have been commissioned into a new identity and assignment. And for you as a Christian, remember that oil throughout the Bible is a picture of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, only few received an anointing. But here you are on this side of the cross in the empty tomb, on this side of Pentecost, you have an anointing. You have a purpose. Don't you settle for just low aims in life. Don't you settle only for lesser goals. You've been created to be a worshiper and a servant of the great and living God. Nothing you do is ordinary nor mundane. You say, well, I'm, I'm just sort of an ordinary person. That's the point. That's the point. The Lord anoints ordinary people like you, like me, to be worshipers and servants of the Most High God. Whatever you do, it makes a difference. And he says, and my cup runs over. Now, let me just pause for a moment. I want you to put on your gratitude glasses and be that thankful person where you will measure your life according to what you have, what you've been gifted, and not just obsess over what you do not have. And I hope you will enjoy the gifts that you've been given without picking them apart mercilessly. Every gift you will receive in this lifetime will be an imperfect gift. But you have an overflowing cup. Now, let me put a picture over here. Of a, there you go. It's just overflowing. You know, in the ancient world, if you had a house guest, you could communicate through nonverbals. If I were ready for you to go, I'd just let your cup run out. If I wanted you to stay a while, I'd just keep refilling it. You know, we have little figures of speech in our, our culture that sometimes you, you have to understand. I had some friends from South Africa, and a few years ago, uh, they, they came to the States. And they'd never uh, been here before. 
And they were Christians, so they started going to church. And some nice folks from church invited them over to their house one Sunday evening. And so my South African friends went there, had a delightful evening. And then as they were leaving, their southern guest said, y'all come back. Now, we all know what that means. Which means when I say y'all come back, I don't really mean it. All right? But they said, y'all come back. So they did. They turned around and went back in. Well, in the ancient world, I'm ready for you to go. I just let your cup run out. But the Lord says to you and me, I'm just going to keep filling it. I never get tired of you. You're not a bother to me. I know everything about you. I care I'm with you. I'm for you. What more can I do to demonstrate my affection to you? I want you to stay a while. How long? Verse 6. Well, surely goodness and mercy. One writer said that sounds like a law firm, doesn't it? A Christian law firm. Who do you work for? Surely goodness and mercy. Who's representing you? Surely, goodness and mercy. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He keeps refilling that cup. Goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. Don't just run past these these words. You remember in the Old Testament when Moses said to the Lord, he said, God, I want you to show me your glory. And you know what glory means. Glory basically means what you're famous for, one of your major attributes. What's the glory of Jose Altuve? Somebody say baseball. That's what he's known for, baseball. God, show me what you're really known for. Well, he's God. He's good at everything. But if you really want to see my glory, Exodus 33, beginning verse 18, Moses said, show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all of my what? I can't hear you. All of my what? Goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. You know, one of the greatest attacks of Satan today is to try to get you to doubt God's goodness. That was his M.O. in the Garden of Eden, going to Adam and, going to Adam and Eve and saying, did God really say, he's not, he's holding back on you. He's trying to keep something from you. But our God is good. Let me put another scripture up here from Psalm 107, verse 1. And this phrase, here you go, Psalm 107, verse 1, there you go. This phrase is the most repeated statement in all the Bible. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. James chapter 1, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. In other words, every gift God, every good thing, it comes from God's hands. Somebody says, well, look at all the fallenness and the brokenness in the world. Where was God when Satan brought that? He introduced that. God is the author of one good thing after another. He says, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Can you imagine me cooking a meal for you and blaming Martha for that? I don't cook. I don't know how to cook. I can grill, but I can't cook. You don't want me cooking a meal for you. You know what Satan does? Satan brings death, destruction, chaos, and he wants to blame God for it. He is good. 
one good gift after another. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. Even those things that are not good, God in his love for you and me works them for good for a purpose who've been called according to his purpose. The shepherd is out front leading. And you got two sheepdogs behind you, chasing you always, goodness and mercy. You know, some of you are running from God because you think God just wants to judge you. You know what God wants to bring to you? Goodness and mercy, goodness and mercy all the days of your life. Here's a scripture on mercy, Titus 3. But when the kindness and love of our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And it goes a step beyond, and it grants to you and gives you what you do not deserve. He saved us, though, through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we become heirs of the hope of eternal life. Goodness and mercy, they follow me all the days of my life. As Jerry Bridges well said, you'll never have a day. Your worst days are never so bad that you're beyond the reach of his mercy. And your best days are never so good that you're beyond the need of his mercy. And then the very last phrase, let's put it up here. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's read that together. Okay, let's do it. You ready? Here we go. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's talk about heaven. Let's talk about the eternal promise of God. You know, Psalm 23 started with the words, the Lord, and it ends with the words, the Lord forever. Here's the way the good shepherd says it in the New Testament. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You believe also in me. And in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I'd go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. What's the good shepherd saying to you and me? You can trust me. You can trust me. You can trust me with your life. And listen, you can trust me with your death. And this is not hard for me. (laughs) This is not hard for God. This is not hard for Jesus to handle. He says, you can trust me on this. I have room for you. I have a place for you. Your death is just a change of address. It's a transition. To be absent in the body, to be present with the Lord. And heaven is not a legend. It is not a myth. It is the promise of God to the people of God. And he takes the fear we have of the unknown, and the good shepherd will obliterate it and say, I'll walk with you. And goodness and mercy are your companions, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, over the last 20, 25 years, a number of of believers have been buried actually with a fork in their hands. And a lot of you uh, know why. It goes back to a story that started circulating some 20, 25 years ago about uh, about a, a, a Christian woman who was terminally ill, she he talks to one of her church leaders, and, and she said, I, I want you uh, to handle this, and I want you to make sure that uh, I'm, I'm buried, that, you know, in my casket, that there's a fork in my hand, and people are going to ask about that, and I want you in the service to be sure and explain why that uh, I have a, a fork in, in my hand. And he said, well, you're going to have to explain it to me because I, I don't know, you know, what you're, uh, what, what you're going for here. And she said, well, I've, I've gone to about a 1,000 church potlucks in my lifetime and if ever somebody comes by and they say to me honey keep your fork I get excited 
because I know something fantastic is coming. I know the best is yet to come. We're about to have deep dish apple pie. But if they say, here, let me take your fork, then I know we're going to get something silly like jello for dessert. And I want to be holding that fork, and people are going to say, well, ask about it, and you tell them. It's because as a believer, we all know the best is yet to come always. Surely goodness follows you all the days of your life. And whatever happens, you're not always cushioned and kept and pampered, but the Lord is with you. But then you dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The worst things in your life will never be the last things. The hardest things in your world will never be the last things. And our hope is sure because it's rooted in the validated resurrection of Jesus Christ himself from the grave. Now then. Let me ask our worship team to be taking their places back up here. But may I ask you, is the Lord your shepherd? He can be. And we'd like to help you take your next step in that direction. Maybe your next step is to start a Bible study, or maybe your next step is to be baptized into Christ. Maybe your next step is to talk to somebody just about what it means to have faith, to become a follower of the Lord. A good thing for you to do is just go to our new here, start here room. We have printed information for you there. We have people there who can talk to you and, uh, and help you take that next step. Someone wrote a psalm, though, for the person who rejects the good shepherd. What if you choose to be the captain of your own soul and your own shepherd? Then your reality goes something like this. I am my own shepherd, and I will never be satisfied. Life makes me restless. It keeps me from lying down in green pastures. It leads me beside troubled waters. It ruins my soul. Sin leads me in paths of unrighteousness, which I pursue for my own sake. And when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will have great fear For the guilt and shame of unforgiven sin will haunt me. And sin prepares a table before me in the presence of my friends. It promises so much, but it always disappoints. And my cup is always empty. Surely goodness and surely judgment and condemnation will follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house of the separated forever. Who wants to say that no one loves you like Jesus, the good shepherd? He invites you to him. He wants that cup overflowing always. He wants goodness and mercy into your life. He wants you dwelling in the house of the Lord forever.